Good morning, church. Uh, last week, we began a conversation about the kind of leaders that Jesus wants in his kingdom. And among all these other very important traits of being a leader in God's kingdom, perhaps the most important one is that you need to have the heart of a servant. The heart of a servant. Now, the Apostle Paul was an instrument, no, not the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, as we looked at last time, was someone who was an instrumental person in the development of the early church. He was a mentor to young people. He was a loving pastor of a major church, right, the Church of Ephesus. He wrote a lot of books in the New Testament that gives us lots of encouragement and hope. But the Apostle John wasn't always like this. Because if you see him when he was younger, John was actually very quick-tempered, and he was very self-centered. I mean, we saw last time that John was someone who would go into each relationship thinking, hmm, like, how can I benefit of you? How can I get you to do something for me? Right? And then, if you have something good for him, if you, have, if you can provide him some benefit, he won't be shy to ask you for it. Just like last time when we saw him go up to Jesus and says, Master, I want you to do for me whatever I ask, right? But then, if you no longer serve a purpose in John's life, then he will just throw you away, just like he threw, you know, just like he uh, threw the ten uh, apostles, ten other apostles under the bus when he went to Jesus to make a side deal. Now, do you guys know anybody who's like this in your life? You know, who goes into each relationship, friendship, with parents, you know, with romantic partners, with your boss, with your coworkers, thinking, what can I get out of this? How, what can you do for me? Or maybe I should ask, like, are you also someone who does this, right? Are you someone who approach each relationship like this? Maybe it's not someone that you know, maybe this is you. I know this is me sometimes. So how did John go from someone who uses people to gain more power for himself, right? But then later in his life, turn into someone who gives away power in order to serve people. How did that happen? And a big reason is because as a young man, Jesus had a very candid conversation with him, right? We saw the beginning of this last week, and then we are going to continue looking at this. And so if you have your Bible, you know, it's not going to be on screen. So please open your phone or your paper Bible. Open it to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 will be in verse 42 to 45. Mark chapter 10, verse 42 to 45. Mark 10, 42 to 45, right? And this is a conversation that you can say changed the life of John because Jesus taught him what it means to be a Christian godly leader, someone who has the heart of a servant. All right, so I invite you to read with me um, Mark 10, 42 to 45. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones, uh, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant. And whoever will be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, means Jesus, that's what Jesus called himself, came not to be served, but to, be, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, for many. This is the word of God. Let's pray with a reverent heart. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this word to teach us what it means um, to be a servant leader and teach us how to use power in our leadership scenarios. We praise you for this. Uh, open our hearts as we receive this word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So no matter how young you are, right, no matter how you are, you have been the leader in some situation. There has been some situation where you play the leadership role. I mean, if you, are, if you have ever led a project at work or school, right, a group project, then you are a leader. Right? If you are a parent, then you are a leader. If you have been a cell leader in church, then you are a leader. If you have younger siblings or younger cousins who play with you often and then you are responsible for their well-being, you know, so that nobody gets hurt, and also you're responsible to keep them entertained with fun games and stuff, then you are a leader. 
no matter how young you are, if you're at school and then you have friends who respect what you say, you know, kind of look up to you, and then they follow, you know, you, they follow you with along with your ideas, then you are a leader. Now, whenever you are in a position of leadership, in this passage, Jesus says you have two choices to make. So you have one choice to make between two options, and that is: Are you going to use your power to lord it over over other people? Or are you going to use your power to serve others, even if it means that you have nothing left at the end? Right? This is the choice that Jesus says. If you are a leader, are you going to use your power to gain, right, to gain benefits for yourself, to lord it over other people, or are you going to take your power to serve others, give it away, even if it means that you might not have anything at the end? But Jesus said this. He lived during the time of the Greco-Roman Empire, right in the first century Israel. And during this period, there were two very influential philosophers that everybody knows because their impact lasts until today. And they are Plato and Aristotle, right? Plato and Aristotle. Now, both of these men have great ideas, but when it comes to power and leadership. These two both believe that some people just have the right to rule over over others. Right? Some people just have the right to rule over others. For example, Plato believed that because the Greeks have the highest form of civilization in the world, therefore it makes sense for the Greeks to lord it over others, even to enslave them. Right? Because it is good for the people of other nations to submit themselves under the rule of the Greek authority. And that's between the Greeks and non-Greeks, right? But even among the Greeks themselves, even within the Greek society, Plato believed that it's the educated philosophers who should rule over everyone. The educated philosophers. So that means, like, if you're not part of the elite class, like, if you're born into a hardworking、uh, woodsmith family, if you're born to the fisherman family, then you know you should just obey your leaders because they know what's best for you. Aristotle, on the other hand, taught that some people are born inferior to others. Right. So Plato talks about this in terms of being educated and also being Greeks. But Aristotle says that might not always be true. But still, some people are just naturally born inferior than others, which makes them more suitable to be slaves, right? To be people of the working class. So, if you are someone who was born into a slave slave family, family, right? If you're born into slavery, then the meaning of your life is to submit to your destiny and be true to who you are as a slave. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Avi. Yes, to be true to who you are as a slave, right? The language of Aristotle, right, has deep influence on us about you know finding your inner sense, of, like finding your finding you find like finding out who you are. But then the way he applies it is unimaginable to modern times. So this is what Jesus had in mind. If you look again at verse forty-two, this is what Jesus had in mind when he says the ruler of Gentiles. Gentiles means non-Jews, right? People who are not the Jewish people. This is what he had in mind when he said the Gentiles、uh, rulers lord it over you and exercise authority over you in harmful ways that you don't like. But it wasn't just the ancient time where power dynamics works like this, because I think you see this in modern time as well, right? Be- like all the benefits, all the privilege in society tends to flow towards people who have power. So in Western society, where democracy rules the day, right?、Um, um, you have people vote for politicians. However, to be honest, politicians don't have that much power. You know who has the real power in the Western world? It's the billionaires, right? It's the billionaires. It's the people who have the money, right? That's why you see all kinds of outrage when Elon Musk bought Twitter a few days ago. But then, on the other hand, you know, like the billionaires in the West could get the politicians to do their bidding, to do anything they want. But on the other hand, if you go to a non-Western country, a more author- authoritarian regime, like maybe China or Russia, right? Like in those places, billionaires actually don't have that much power. As you can, you know, if you if you're not aware of, but Jack Ma, who is like the Elon Musk of China, disappeared last year for like ten months. Because he criticized the financial system of the governments of the Chinese, you know, communist regime. 
So in an authoritarian government, billionaires don't have that much impact, but it's the politicians who have all the power. Now, whether you're in the West right, or in elsewhere, whether you are in a democratic country or authoritarian country, privileges and benefits always flow towards the powerful. You might define who has power differently, but privileges and, and benefits always flow towards the people who are in power. But then Jesus says in this passage, you see it, right? Like you can read it for yourself, that if you are a Christian who is in a position of leadership, instead of collecting privileges as part of your power, you must use your power to serve others. Even if it means that you will lose all your power and status and privileges yourself. Furthermore, if you look at verse 45, Jesus said in this passage, I don't just teach you this, I embody it for you. Because if you think about it, imagine if Justin Trudeau says, all you guys, give away your power to serve others, but he doesn't do it. Right? What would that be? Like, that's hypocrites, right? And then that would just make society a very oppressive place. Imagine if we have a God who says that to us, but doesn't do it himself. It would be a scary place, right? But then Jesus did this. Jesus did this. He died as a ransom to save our souls, right? He literally gave away all of his power. You know how radical this is? Like how radical this teaching from Jesus actually was? Look at verse 43 again. When everyone said the powerless should be slaves to the powerful. So I'm reading the ESV version. Right? Other, other, other version might translate in different words, but the meaning is the same. When, other, when everyone else said the powerless should be slaves to the powerful, Jesus said it's the powerful who should be slaves to the powerless. It's the powerful who should be slaves to the powerless. And Jesus says, I don't just commend this to you. I live this out. I embody it for you. I do it for you. Like, this is so radical. You don't hear things like this elsewhere. But then, I think deep down, we all know that this is how a leader should act, right? We might not see it exemplified very well in society, but we all know this is how a leader should act. We know that a leader exists to serve the people that he's leading, not the other way around. So very quickly, if you were to practice kind of servant leadership in your life, what is it going to look like? I want to just quickly highlight two examples you know, for those of us you know, who are in a position of leadership. Number one, whenever your team is successful, you as a servant leader, don't take the credit for yourself, right? You share the platform, you share the spotlight, you move to the back, you let your team shine. But on the other hand, if things don't go well, you don't do the same, right? You don't say, hey, it's uh, this guy's fault, right? Because you're the leader, you don't pass the blame around. The box stops with you, and you take full responsibility for any, you know, without any excuse. That might mean this will lead to your downfall, right? And then, but then you do this because you're a servant leader. You give away your power to bless and to serve the people around you. Too often we see in our society when it's the leaders who throw the followers under the bus, but that it should be the leaders who goes under the bus. Right, now, if you're doing a group project in school, maybe, or maybe you're running an organization somewhere, doing this, right, is going to keep you humble and to continue to help you grow into a servant leader. That's one example. Another example I can think of is when we value people over progress. When we value people over progress. What does that mean? Like, I remember when I was a new, you know, new graduate out of Waterloo, and I got a job at TD um, as a software developer. I worked on a coding project with several other senior folks, right? So like, I was the only junior guy on the team. And our team lead was this man in his 40s, I think, who was amazing at coding, right? Amazing at coding. Now, he was a short-term contractor, 
right? So for those of you who are not in, uh, in the workplace yet, a short-term contractor basically means that you're not there long-term, right? You're here to do a job and get out. If you don't do your job within a particular time frame, you don't, if you don't do it well, guess what? You lose your reputation, you're not going to be asked back again. So for, for our team lead at the time, the best way for him to make sure he gets the most for himself would have been to put me to the side, right? To put me to the side and then do as much of as much of the work as he can, you know, himself, so that he can deliver everything on time, so that he maintain his stellar reputation and collect a big paycheck. But then instead, my leader at the time slowed down, not just himself, sometimes the projects to involve me because he believed that by involving a junior like me, that was the right thing to do because he believed that he needed to value people over progress. Now in software engineering, we have this term called code monkey. Code, I don't know if it's, you guys use it elsewhere, but at least in IT, I don't know, we call some people code monkey. Now, what does that mean? It's like when you are, sometimes when you're writing code, there are things that are really fun to work with. There are problems that are really challenging to solve and it's really fun. But then, on the other hand, there are some problems in coding where you don't really have to use your brain, you just have to do it, right? You have to use your finger, typing, you know, your fingers are moving, but your brain is not working, and therefore we call them code monkeys. When you're a junior developer, you're basically doing code monkey work most of your time for like the first several months to, you know, maybe a year. But then at the time on that project, my team lead gave me meaningful work. And then he would stop every day, you know, he would spend time to teach me for sometimes hours about what's going on and then try to get me involved. Now, I don't know if he was a Christian or not, but that was servant leadership, right? That's servant leadership because he cared for my growth more than the progress of the project. He put his reputation on the line to make sure that I'm involved and I can grow as a developer. Now, I think for most people, we would agree with the principle of servant leadership. Like, we agree that when things are going well, we would strive to do this. But I find that the challenge is that things don't go, always go well. Right? Things don't always go well because the people that you're leading are not always nice to you. They don't treat you right. right? They don't treat you right. Back in, uh, back in university, I had a professor who was in, uh, in linear algebra. And boy, I hate the course. Do you guys hate linear algebra? Or do you like linear algebra? Yeah, I hate linear algebra. And then one of the reasons I hate linear algebra was because my professor was horrible at giving lectures. Right? Like he would explain things in ways that only a genius like him would understand. And then the problem was when you look at our class, maybe like 2% are geniuses. So everybody else sits there all confused. We take notes, but we're like fighting monkeys or something, right? Like we don't we don't know what was going on. And moreover, um, Moreover, over time, our, the classmates in my class, we have learned to not ask the professor questions, even when you're confused. Because if you ever ask him to clarify, he's just gonna go into another you know, world where he explains things in even more complicated terms that will confuse you even more. Now, some of you are thinking, hey, that's like half of my professor. <laughs> but one day during lecture, you know, when he was just, I don't know, going off again, and at the end of yet another complicated explanation to something that was probably much simpler than he made it out to be, one of the students in class just suddenly went, ah, oh, that was useless. I can't imagine what happens in the class. Like, we're all heads down, quiet, writing. One guy just suddenly said that. Now, he meant to just whisper to himself. But then since the whole class was quiet at the time, we all heard it. And then we all just start laughing, right? We all just burst out laughing for like 20 seconds. The professor was visibly triggered and embarrassed and angry. So he started raising his voice and he was like, actually, this is not useless. You know why? Because I'm going to put it on the finals. You know why it's going on the final? Because I'm the professor and you're not and you do the work that I tell you to do. So why do I share with you that story? Because it's easy to be a servant leader when your people are lovable, right? And also very appreciative of you. It's easy to be a servant leader when that's the case. But then most of the time, most of the time, not maybe not most of the time, but a lot of the times, the people you're leading 
are jerks, right? They're jerks. They don't like you. They make you feel undervalued. They make you feel underappreciated. Have you ever found yourself in a scenario like this? Sometimes you are, let's say, uh, parents, right? And you just had a bad day. So you come home, and then you see your kid playing on his phone. Of course, right? Playing on his phone. And then just says, oh, hi. Goes back, looking at his phone again. And you just can't stand him, right? Like on a normal day, you'll be like, I'm a good dad. I'm a good mom. I'm a servant leader when at home. Therefore, I'm not going to yell at my kids, right? I'm going to treat him with love. But then you're coming home, you have a bad day, you can't stand this attitude. So then you just have this urge, right, rising up within you to tell him to put it down the phone, go do your dishes or something, like make yourself useful around the house. Sometimes you're a leader among your friends, right? Maybe you're just someone who follows. You have natural leadership skills, so your friends look up to you. You know, like you're the highlights of the party. And you try to be nice and friendly to everyone. You know, you try to treat people with respect, use your power in all the right ways. But then sometimes somebody is going to uh, say something that offends you, right? They're going to gossip behind your back. You'll discover what people really think of you when you're, you're, you're not around, right? They're gonna, you're they're, they're, they're going gonna to get all these things, Bla- blasphemy, slanders. And deep down, you know that if you really want, you can use your power to crush them. Right? Like you can get all your friends to ignore this person, gossip about her, you know, do something behind their backs to make their life just miserable. Right? Make their life miserable. Sometimes you're a ministry leader. At, sometimes you're like a church leader. Right? You're a ministry leader at church. And you have a lot of passion for God. But then you look at the people you're leading or look at your coworkers in church or look at the, you know, the, around the fellowship and you're like, man... Like, what am I doing here? These guys, so lazy, man. These guys, so lazy. I'm not saying you guys, okay. Uh, this is just gesture, right? Uh, so lazy, man. Like, why can't they spend more time to be living, to live out their faith? Why are they doing this? And then just in your heart, there comes this urge to call them out and shame them. It's so hard to be a servant leader in those scenarios, right? Like being a servant leader is all nice in principle, but it's when the push comes to shove. It's when the rubber meets the road. That's when the challenge actually comes. And yet it's in these moments that Jesus wants us to step in. And instead of being serve, he wants us to serve, as the passage tells us, right? It's in, those, in these moments when we can grow into a servant leader by Understanding that our role here is not to be served, but to be served. Sorry, it's not to be served, but to serve. But, but then, where do we find motivation to do it like that? Like when it gets hard, where does the motivation come from? In verse 45, right? So if you look in your Bible, in verse 45, Jesus said, the way you can find motivation is by looking to him as an example and also as a savior. Look to Jesus as an example and look to Jesus as a savior. This is what I mean. Jesus is the king of the universe, right? Like he has the ultimate authority over all humankind because he creates, he sustains, he governs, he protects, he maintains everything in this world. He has the ultimate authority over all of us. And yet, when he was walking around Israel, ministering to the poor and the oppressed, you know, 2,000 years ago, it wasn't like he was well-loved by everyone. Some people liked him. A lot of people did not. Like, even though Jesus tried to love and serve, even though he embodied what it means to be a servant leader, people didn't always respond nicely to him, right? Like, there were slanders. They were accusa- false accusations. And eventually people even put him on the cross for things that, you know, for, 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 for false reasons. Now, as the king of the universe, Jesus could have just called down an army of angels and just crush everyone, right, and just wipes them out. He could have just exercised his authority over them, but he didn't do that. Instead, 
Jesus died for their sins. He died for their sins. And when he was dying on the cross, Jesus was praying for his enemies. When the Roman soldiers were banging nails into his hand, Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Now, if you're a Christian, then at the very heart of your faith is a man dying for his enemies, right? At the very heart of your faith is a man dying for his enemies. So when you try to lead like a servant, but then the people are leading, are, are just you know, making you feel like, like you're not worthy, when things just get really difficult with the people that you're leading, you can come to Jesus. Jesus invites you to come because what? He understands what that feels like. He understands what, that's, what it feels like to be betrayed and slandered by the people that you lay down your lives for. When you feel hurt and you just want to lash out and impose your will on people, before you do all that, come to Jesus in prayer, right? That's the invitation. And be real with him. Tell him exactly how you feel and then ask him to speak to you. And as you spend time in prayer, in worship, in Bible reading, you know, as you talk to your Christian friends about this, Jesus is going to minister to you and encourage you so that you can go back out there to lead like a servant again, right? Jesus will help you process all your negative emotions so that you can go back out there and continue to live out your faith as a servant leader. But that's not all. Because if you're the Christian, if you're a Christian, then you also understand that when Jesus died for his enemy, he wasn't talking about some random people out there, right? Jesus didn't die for those people as his enemy. Jesus was talking about you when he says, I lay down my life for you as a ransom for you. He was talking about you as his enemy that he died for. You are the one who did not show appreciation to him when he did so much for you. You're the one who puts the nails in his hand when you repeatedly and regularly sin in your life. When Jesus was on the cross praying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing, he wasn't praying for some random people out there. He was praying for you. Right? He was praying for you. And at the very heart of your worldview as a Christian is Jesus dying for you because he loves you. So whenever you feel hurt, whenever you feel offended, you can come back to the gospel and find healing. Like whenever you feel tempted to just rule over people harshly because you can, you can come to the cross Meditate on it, right? The invitation is to come, to stand at the foot of the cross, beholding the glory of Jesus and all that he's done for you and receive strength and perseverance to continue as a leader. I learned about this guy this week, Nicholas Zizendorf. I don't know, I don't know if I said it right. Nicholas Zizendorf was an 18th century German aristocrat who was born into lots of privilege and power, right? Because he has high status, his family has high status in society. Therefore, in that feudal system, um, he was very rich and powerful. Not because he worked hard, but because he was born into it. But instead of, you know, seeing this at his birthright, he spent all of it to serve people throughout his life. So that at the end of his life, he basically had nothing left. For example, um, he formed a community where refugees fleeing from political and religious persecution could find a safe place to build a new life. And also there was one time when he heard about the suffering of the slaves on a Caribbean island, and then he decided to use his personal wealth to sponsor lots of missionaries to go over there, preach the gospel to them, and then help them alleviate all the suffering and horrendous condition that they were living under. By the end of his life, as I just said, he had nothing left. He poured everything out. As a servant leader, he used up all his resources to help those who are suffering. He helped the people that God placed under his leadership. You guys know what motivated him to do this? What changed his heart and life in this direction? When he was 19 years old, 
One day, he was in a city in Germany studying, right? 19, right? That's like similar to a lot of people in our church. He found himself gazing at the picture, a painting by another guy, I don't know how to say, but Domenico Fetti, right? Sounds like an Italian painter. Now, it was the image of the suffering Jesus wearing a crown of thorns, as you can see here. And the young Zizendorf, 19-year-old Zizendorf, stood in front of this painting in complete shock. And he could not leave for a very long time. Underneath the painting, there was an inscription. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to see. But underneath the painting, there's an inscription that says, All this I did for you. What will you do for me? It's almost as if Jesus is speaking to him, saying, All this I did for you. Look at my crown of thorns. What will you do for me? And that question changed this young man from the inside out, changed the direction of his life. And I think it's the main point of this passage today as well, because Jesus said to John in this passage, as well as saying to you and I today, remember how I gave up my life to build you up? Now, if you wish to follow me, go and do the same for the people that you're leading. Go and do the same for the people that you're leading. Today is Mother's Day. And how fitting it is that on Mother's Day, we are talking about servant leadership. Because for many of us, our moms are the first and perhaps the best model of servant leaders in our life, Right? I remember a few years ago, a friend of mine wrote a post on Facebook about moms. And I think it just really summarized very well what our moms do for us. Let me read a part, uh, some, some of it to you guys. She wrote, When you were one, she fe- fed you and bathed you, but you would cry all night. Right? That, that's Haley. <laughs> when you were three, she cooked for you, but you refused to eat. That's also Haley. (laughs) When you were five, she bought you pretty clothes, but then you play in the mud and just mess it all up. When you were seven, she caught you a basketball, but then you uh, threw it, breaks the windows of your neighbors, have her to pay another thousand dollars for it. When you were nine, she sent you to arts and uh, music classes so that in the future you have some skills and interests so you can be more well-rounded, but then you found her so annoying, you give her attitude because you just want to sleep in on weekends. When you were 11, she took you and your friends to see a movie because you're underage, but then you says, Mom, can you go sit at another row? Like, don't come near us because I don't want to see people to see, you, see me with you. When you're 13, she paid for you to go to a summer camp, but then you have too much fun that you forgot to even reply to her text. When you were 15, she wanted to hug you when you come back from school, and then just say, oh, disgusting, man. You dodge her and you go into your room. When you're 18, she was moved to tears at your high school graduation, and you decided to stay out all night with your friends instead of spending time with her. When you're 20, she asks you, hey, where you have been all day? I can't find you. And you're like, mom, I actually have things to do, you know? Like, I actually have places to be unlike you. When you're 30, she, bought, she taught you how to take care of your children. And you told her, mom, times are different now. We don't raise our kids this way anymore. When you're 40, she called you on your birthday and you were too busy to take her call. When you're 50, she was sick and she needed you, but then you have too much going on in your life to spend quality time with her. When I was reading this, you know, isn't it interesting that no matter how old we are, we find a way to drive our mom crazy? (laughs) It's not a kid's thing. We do this throughout our life. And yet through it all, for a lot of us, our moms persevere, right? And she lays down her life for us. Our moms are the best examples of servant leaders in our life. Actually, not the best. Jesus is the best. But outside of Jesus, our moms are the best servant leaders in our life. 
So for those of us who have an awesome mom, we praise the Lord, right? And today, we're going to celebrate, honor, and appreciate them. But I also know that not everyone has the privilege to grow up in a family with a loving mom. Like, in fact, a few days ago, we were talking about it in uh, adult life group, and it was very heartbreaking to hear, you know, the stories. And I know it's not just the adults. I know, you know, for young people in this room, I know not everyone grows up in a family with a loving mom. However, I believe the empty hole that our moms left behind is the one that Jesus wants to come and fill for us. Right? So, church family, I want to invite you guys to stand and let's sing a song of blessings right, to God and then also to thank God for our moms. <laughs>